I'd like to introduce firstly Angela. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Angela and I connected I think at the beginning of this year or late last year when Ange reached out and said that she too was, um, you know, had experienced family violence and domestic violence and was really passionate about sharing her story to help other people, especially other women. Um, Ange's story has a sort of a unique element but in many ways it's, it's not, it's very common in that she, and she will explain more about this in time, but um, part of her journey of escaping a violent marriage was, was made a little bit more difficult because of the lack of awareness um, around the fact that domestic violence doesn't discriminate and it can happen in relationships where, you know, a partner is maybe even religious or, you know, Christian or Buddhist or whatever they may be, but we'll, we'll get to that. But that was certainly um, something that made Angie's escape from her marriage um, more difficult as well. So, um, Angie, can you just share with us a little bit about your earliest memories growing up? Um, so my earliest memories um, are from when I was aged about three. Um, my stepfather um, was a very violent man and I, I remember two or three different times where my mother was getting another beating, which were quite regular for her. And it's, it's like a movie that plays in my head and I can see the shadows going backwards and forwards, which were my mum and my stepdad. And I am either sitting on the lounge or in the corner of the room with my one-year-old brother and of course he's screaming and crying and I'm trying to stop him from crying because I knew that that Joe hated him and I knew that Joe could hurt him so they're my earliest memories of, of family violence um, just three years old, and that's a lot to put on a three-year-old's shoulders. Um, and uh, uh, apparently I used to hide in cupboards. <laughs> so I found out a long time later. Um, and I'm guessing that would have been the times when my brother was asleep. So, um, yeah, that's, that was pretty traumatic for me. Yeah. And so, your stepfather uh, or your mother was able to get you and your brother out of that situation by the time you were eight, was uh, it? Or? I was about four. four. Um, she left when um, I got a full fist punched to my forehead, so which I don't remember. Um, I am glad that she left. I'm, I will always be grateful that she did that. Um, I, I always wish that she had been able to leave for herself and not because I got hit. Because to her it was just normal. You know, she'd go down the shop uh, and have a black eye and the shopkeeper would say, oh, where'd you get a black eye from? She'd go, oh, Joe gave it to me. Just, <sighs> just normal. Um, so yeah, I wish she'd been able to change it for herself. And so once you were out of that situation, did you, what were your teenage years life? Did you, did you feel safer or did you feel like you were still carrying anxiety or, or trauma from those I, early years? I don't think it ever left, to be honest. I think from, from living in that environment from when I was, you know, very little to about four years old, it's like those memories, those emotions, the things that I can't even remember, but I can feel shaped who I was and the way I looked at life and having to be resilient and having to be strong because if I didn't, no one else was going to be that. Mm -hmm. Because I didn't have that protection from my mother. I didn't have those people who were supposed to love you and nurture you. I had to do that for myself um, and that, that 
I don't know it ever really leaves you, really. Um, it causes you a lot of trust issues. Um, so I have had struggled with that for a very long time. Um, not letting people too close. And I think it, it impacted me the most when my children were three and one. Because one day I just, I don't know, I just casually looked at them and it just it struck me just how tiny I was and how vulnerable I really was. Um, so yeah, that, that had a big impact on me. And I think one thing I really connected with your story was that when you went out into the world as a young woman and you were trying to, you know, meet men and form relationships, I think you had, we shared some similar um, elements in our story in that we had trouble picking, you know, the guys who were going to be healthy role models and partners. Um, what, can you share a bit about how you met, you know, your former husband and and what, what he was like when you first met him? Uh, I met him at uh, church youth group and uh, I was 18 and uh, he was 21, I think. So, I don't know, I was just very naive, I think. And, um, you know, people say they, often women say they marry their dad. Yeah, no, I married my mum. <laughs> so, um, I think he was very, it felt very familiar because he was so much like my mother, who was the dominant parent. And he was very charming. He was, uh, he looked a bit like Richard Gere, actually. Um, I know your girlfriends were like super jealous of that Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, totally. Um, he was quiet. He liked to be in the background. But the same as what you were saying yourself, there was that over yeah you know you're my everything you you know um i i can't live without you um and my girlfriends all thought that was amazing they're like oh god i wish my husband talked like that i'm like no you really you don't because it was so suffocating um when did it change from say just those, you know, those lashings of adoration to control and gaslighting. And what uh -oh. were some of the behaviours that started to, to happen, you know, after the, the months, in months into the relationship? It starts with almost nothing. It starts with something so small and it's so insidious. You don't even know it's happening to you until at some point down the road you start, you realise you are doubting yourself and you're second guessing yourself because maybe I did say something in a certain way that maybe that did upset him or, um, or maybe I shouldn't be wearing this outfit or, um, you know, getting ready for church one night. And he said, so who do you think that you're going to impress? thinking I'm just going to church. <laughs> um, I think those things, the things you can't put your finger on to start with, and of course that, that does escalate over time. Behaviours become... Um, I think in your chapter you shared that it started off with those really minor things that yes. you sort of couldn't put your finger on, but then over time it became like in our house, demands to know where you were, demands oh, yes. to know who you were hanging out with yep. and were. Who my friends were, who my friends could be, how I should speak, how I shouldn't speak, what I couldn't, couldn't wear. Um, I would get woken up in the night, um, the witching hour of between one and two in the morning. And uh, it, there would be always some grievance over what I did do 
didn't do or should have or could have or would have, depending on whatever particular hurt he had that night. And so, you know, there'd be argument, you know, until it was time to go, to get up actually, to go to work. So, you know, for a long time I was having a lot of sleep deprivation and still having to go to work and look after the kids and the house. And you just don't function very well. And did you share with any of your friends or anyone what was going on at home? Oh, no, no. Because everybody thought he was so great. And that was one of the things people said to me was, but he's such a nice guy. I'm like, really? Maybe you live with him for six months and then you live my life and then maybe you can tell me he is such a nice guy. Because he did put me through years and years of gaslighting and deep hurt and, you know, I really began to resent this person that was supposed to love me. That questioned everything I did and everywhere I went and uh, would ring my friends, for example, and say, did Angela come over because she said she was coming to this lingerie party? Things like that. Yeah, it became really hard to handle. And so what, what helped you hold on during those years where you were, you know, under such intense, you know, mental abuse? And I, I know for you it wasn't, it wasn't so much physical, it was more the, the mental abuse and the gaslighting. What do you think it was that helped you to, to find the strength just to keep going during those years? I put a lot of pressure on myself and I was trying to live up to what I thought were other people's expectations. Um, I didn't want to not be married. I didn't want my children to not have their dad around. Um, I didn't want to fail at something. And I just thought if I keep trying to do the things that he's wanting me to do, if I just work harder, then maybe he'll be happy or pleased or maybe we won't go round this mountain again and again and again. So... And so eventually you got to a point and, you know, people are, will, will leave, you know, this for people to read in your story in more detail, yeah. but, you know, eventually you share how you got to the moment where you were able to yes. leave that relationship. Um, and as you said, as you alluded to, it had a lot to do with noticing how vulnerable your children were and just like you and your brother, um, and you were able to find the, the strength to leave. Yeah. Um, can you share a little bit about what things helped you once you were out? What, what helped you to start to put your life back together after leaving an abusive relationship? Because that's, that's often the, the hardest part for people is getting out, yes. but then they think once they're out, everything will just be fine and they'll just go, go on back to normal. So. Yeah. What were some things that helped you to start rebuilding your life? I initially did a 12 week, pro 12 week program with um, a domestic violence centre in Brisbane, um, up at Caboolture. And they took me through a program that helped me unpack it all and helped me to understand that I was a worthwhile person and that I wasn't even though I was broken, that I could put myself back together. And I had a lot of really good things to offer people and I wasn't any of those things that I had been conditioned to believe. So, um, and that was a really tough three months because I would go home crying. I'd be driving home and crying because of that particular session that day had been pretty heavy. Um, but that was probably the best thing I could have done for myself because it helped me to see the, the things that I've been living that I didn't realise were domestic violence. Um, because most, almost all of it was not physical. And in some ways I wished that it had been because I knew from a very early age, if anyone had hit me, I was gone. And that's exactly how I felt as yeah. well. And I think that's why I ignore those red flags yeah. for so long because I went, oh, well, he hasn't, he hasn't hit me, so it's not yeah. abuse. 
yeah. And they'd always be sorry and then there'd be this lovely, you know, honeymoon phase where they'd, everything would be really great but then something would set him off and then, you know, you're walking on the eggshells for who knows how long until then you come back to the deeply sorry and I won't do it again and I can't believe I said that to you, etc, etc. Um, so the things that really helped me was firstly making sure that I got really solid help, really good, um, I suppose relearning about who I was as a woman and a, and a, and a mum and learning my self-worth and that I could do it because sometimes you think once they you've made them leave or or you have left that that's it that's it it's all going to be over i was really glad i couldn't see actually that the leaving was the easiest part because to be perfectly honest the next seven years of my life were hell because he made it that way so you have to have something in you, I think. You have to have that, that core strength deep inside you that says, I can do it and I will pick myself up again and I will dust myself off again, even though I may be crying um, right now, I've cried all night or I'm angry or I'm, I hate him or I'm so resentful. Because what other choice did I have in, my, in the way I've always felt? If I don't do it, no one else will or can. And I think from having been exposed to so much violence and trauma as a little child, I had to be resilient. I had to, to survive my family and the, the many changes I went through in my childhood. So it was, I don't know, it just, it was there. I had to do it. And so obviously we want people to, you know, learn, read through more of this detail in your chapter. But um, what I think one thing that I find really incredible about you is that you still have to, like you said, pick yourself up and dust yourself off every day. And Ange actually, you know, ha lives with, with chronic pain. And I think there's, you know, could be some people here today who know what that's like and I think it's um that was a big reason too why why I wanted to work with Ange to share her story because it's uh sometimes people think well I ca how can I how can I pick myself up and and learn to love life again when I'm dealing with something every day and it's never going to go away so that was also why I wanted Ange to share her story because she still has to fight every day for her mental health and to look after herself and find ways to to you know live with purpose and um, a sense of you know love for life despite the fact that she still has things that are affecting her every day um, can you just share just really briefly what what are some things that you're grateful for in your life today and and what are some things that you know what are maybe a couple of your reasons you know reasons for living life to the fullest today um. I'm really just very grateful that I've got some really good friends that have, particularly while I've been living in Melbourne for the last six and a half years, that just, they're there for you and they, they know what I've been through, they know what I've had to deal with. And I think having that support has been, I just, you can't put a price on that. You know, it's been just so incredibly helpful. Um, you know, from previous workmates to um, my pastor Rose and my church family. Um, and having people like that around me, you, when you have those positive people who help you, they lift you out of whatever you're feeling or they they just know that you're going through something. They're just still there for you. And they love you no matter what. Um, that means more to me than anything because 
they are the family that I need and they help me to be stronger. You know, and my great son Daniel, what could I, what could I do? Um, you know, having my son in my life is the single most thing I'm the most grateful for because I didn't always have him. And um, yeah. <laughs> Well, thank you so much for being brave enough. Can we give you a It's not easy to, you know, share your story with, you know, a group of, of people who you may or may not know. So really appreciate you sharing a bit of that. Thank and you. Of course, you can, you can, you know, read Angie's full chapter and there's a lot of amazing stuff in there and really inspiring stories in there that, you know, she hasn't shared today. So it's a... Yeah, really, really great read and I do believe it will help a lot of other people and particularly women who are still in abusive relationships.